Development Council, and we are really honored and pleased to be asked to sponsor this event. Thanks to our friends, the um, Concerned Catholics of Montana, that um, wonderful group, um, and a special thanks to Rosemary and Jim Tackett, who um, they convinced us that the first thing we needed to do this spring was bring Michael Morwood here, and we're really pleased. Um, I should say the distance prize goes to Illinois. We have someone here who came from Illinois and another from Iowa. I think Iowa hasn't arrived yet, but we'll all cheer when he does. So word has spread because our guest is uh, nationally and internationally known. So we're moving from the Western Montana Spiritual Development Council to a little larger uh, venue. We will be taping tonight by your presence here. You've just consented to be taped, but you can certainly move to the back tables if your hair is a little... Well, <laughs> you don't want it to show up. Uh, that means that uh, MCAP, the treasurer of Missoula, Montana, will be here all day tomorrow and we will be able to make copies and you can send them to your adult children who don't understand why you still go to church. <laughs> and they might get it. I understand that's been very effective. Uh, and there is space tomorrow if you get so excited about it that you don't want to uh, you want to come back, we certainly will have room. Our guest tonight, Michael Morwood, is the theologian in residence at Kirkwood Retreat Center, which if you ever lived on the East Coast, you'd all have known about because it's quite famous and quite prestigious and a uh, really great place to be. Uh, he has brought the books he's written. He was a parish priest in Australia for over 30 years, and I think he speaks with that kind of understanding of how to make theology really understandable to those of us who uh, don't want to read Niebuhr and Goldsman and all of those German theologians that are pretty indecipherable. Um, the books are on the table. The last one is called It's Time, and as a good Methodist, I want you to know it's certainly time, they get the title, for a lot of things to change, not just in the Catholic Church. So take a look at them. I think they'll go fast. I would ask if you want to buy books tonight, you might get in line first so that those of us tomorrow won't get in your way, but certainly uh, do take a look at them. Um, and I think the thing that I'm so excited about with Michael is he's able to really put things in very um, human terms, for me at least, uh, that I understand, and I think that does come from his parish ministry. And I remember when I read his Holy Week Reflections, what stuck with me, is he explained why Jesus got out of bed every morning. So I'm hoping by the time this ends, you'll understand what got Jesus up every morning and why you should also get up every morning and get going. So, Michael, are we ready? Now we can start filming. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings all and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, does this sound okay? Can you hear me? One of the most valuable questions that I was ever taught to ask about my faith was to ask, certainly as an adult, what are you asking me to imagine? And I think anyone, any adult of whatever religion should ask that question of their faith. What are you asking me to imagine? And then to ask the question, and where did that imagination come from? We are living through a time of, of the greatest shift ever in imagination, and I, I do not use the word imagination 
in the sense of make-believe. I'm using imagination in the sense of how do I image reality? For all of us in this room tonight, through our lifetime, we have undergone such incredible shifts in imagination, in our understanding of reality. When I was a small boy, I knew nothing about galaxies. When I was a small boy, I knew nothing about the age of this planet. I knew nothing about a scientific story about humanity emerged. I learnt a story at the age of seven that was biblical, it wasn't scientific. When I was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church in 1969, I knew nothing about galaxies. I knew nothing about an expanding universe. I knew nothing, very little, about the age of this planet and how life developed. Faith has to be built on reality. If faith is not built on reality, then faith collapses. And the task in the Christian context, and as I say for the Jewish context, Islamic context, context, any religion at all, is how do we bring the basic tenets of our belief? And for us Christians it is, how do I today bring the story of Jesus of Nazareth to the 21st century and to the imagination, to the understanding of reality of the 21st century? Because if, that, if we fail that task, then we should not be surprised that the young are not in our churches. We should not be surprised that as adults so many of us are questioning a faith with which we grew up and which we were nurtured and were told never to question. And now we find we have all sorts of questions that maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago we could not have imagined we would be asking. So what are you asking me to imagine is a theme that will run through this weekend. And where did this imagination come from? And the question constantly will be, what imagination are you walking in as you articulate faith today? Another way to say that is, what story? What story around God? What story around Jesus of Nazareth are you walking in? Because if it is a story that is biblical, if it's a story of 2,000 years ago of a flat earth and a God who lived up there, it may make sense to a lot of people. But it's not a story coming out of reality. It is unreal. So the task confronting us as Christians and confronting people of other religions as well around this mystery that we call God. And that's our starting point today. When we use this word G-O-D, what are you asking me to imagine? And what are the images that we have carried all of our lives? And where do those images come from? And we all know how hard it is to let go of some of those images. How, do the, how does our imagination around this mystery we call God fit in with the 21st understanding of the immensity of our universe? The second key plank that we'll begin tonight as well is, I believe we cannot tell the story of Jesus without telling the story of humanity. And if the story of humanity is the story that I learnt as a seven-year-old, that we emerged into paradise and that God locked us out, and that I was a poor, banished child of Eve, then yes, we grow into a story around Jesus that's based on that imagination and on that story. So then we have to ask, 
in the 21st century, what is our story about humanity? What is it to be human? What is our place in the universe? And then when we can tell something of this story, something of, of uh, new windows, uh, new pointers to the mystery we call God, and then in that mystery, in that window, if we can articulate something of, of the absolute wonder, the absolute wonder of what it is to be human, then we can use this lens to go back and tell the story of Jesus in a fresh way. A story that affirms, encourages, challenges, and it's a story that humanity in the 21st century desperately needs to hear. And it is not a story about humanity cut off from a God in heaven. It's a different story. And the story's in our Gospels, and we have to recover it through the lens, through the window we have available today, and that is our understanding of reality. What's our understanding of reality? I say to people today, I will not argue theology with you. I won't. But what I will do, if people want to, I'll ask them, what's the story that you're walking in? What's the imagination that you're walking in? What's the story of humanity you're walking in? And I'll respect that that's where they are. But hopefully we'll come to an understanding that if you walk in that story, you are going to reach different conclusions to where I am in this story, or in this understanding of reality. So let's begin tonight. We have a, a fair bit of time tonight, and so let's make it a bit of a working night. Uh, and some people can only be here tonight. So what I plan to do is work in three sessions, around about half an hour each. We have two and a half hours, so that gives you an hour of free time to do what you like. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have time just to talk round tables and have a break, stand up and, and, and whatever. So the first session I want to look at this, this mystery, this reality that we call God. Let's have the lights off. So who? And see now it's not even, not even confined to a who. What is God? What, what do we think we are talking about? And, 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 and where? where? Where is, if, if we want to believe in a mystery we call God, what, what do we think we are we're believing in. What are you asking me to imagine if you use the word God? I know what I imagine most of my life, you know, I know what gods are. And then tonight we'll look at, well, who are we and, and how are we in relationship with this mystery? And as I said a moment ago, you know, I grew up with a story that we were disconnected from this mystery. Christi, Christian theology, Christian Christology, the Christian creed it is all, all of it. It's all based on an understanding that humanity was disconnected from God. What are you asking me to imagine? Where, does it, where did this imagination come from? Is it the only imagination, the only story that I have in the 21st century to walk? That's God punishing me. <laughs> That's the flat earth. <laughs> so if we were to go back, say, 10,000 years ago in this country or in Australia, uh, and that's the accent if you don't know, then, okay, wh whatever people thought of the earth, but, but people, indigenous people around the earth, had a sense that uh, there was a spirit world all around them. And I'm going to use a, a, a pink overlay to depict the spirit world. So, you know, their concept of, of, of reality, the concept of the universe, it wasn't understanding. But the indigenous, what's going on? 
Oh, all right, I'm sorry, it's okay. I thought it was the Spirit of God, sort of, you know. <laughs> but they, they we, we, we could have them off, I think. Well, we can film you with that Sorry? We need to film you. Oh, you don't need to see me. <laughs> so, but, but people had a sense, or whatever they called it, that all around them there was a spirit world. That it's in the rivers, it's in the trees, it's in the bushes. And somehow we have to live in harmony with the spirit world around us. And, and then the, the, the writers of religious history tell us that maybe, what, 7,000, 8,000 years ago, with the growth of formal religion, a, a, a significant shift occurred. And part of that significant shift, both in religion and in Greek philosophical thought, was to take the divine from here and to put it up into the heavens. And so Greek philosophy, the Platonic philosophy, it's about you know, the pure, the essence, our, our souls really come from, down, from a place of, of perfection up above down to this material changing world and there's no connection between there and there so you need a semi-god to be the mediator. The shift from that fairly quickly, this is not the stars and stripes, but is, is a shift to articulate an understanding of gods. And so it went from a sense of, 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 of the, the spirit world all around us to having the gods in heaven. Now the gods, I mean the word God is so important. What, what is a God? Almost by a definition, a, a God is a heavenly being, you know, who has immense powers and can interfere and control. So what do you need? You need middle management, don't you? <laughs> eh? You need middle management to be able to tell us what to do, to stop getting the gods angry. Well, that makes some people very important in any community. Then our tradition, based on Judaism, 4,000 years ago came the time when, when a people came to a concept, well, there may be many gods, and they still believe that, but the greatest and the one almighty divine being was Yahweh. And Yahweh was a heavenly God, happens to be male, and, 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 and he lived in the heavens. And, and sure, you can see in Hebrew thought the sense that, you know, if I go from the east to the west, you are there. Sure, there's a sense that the breath of God breathed into creation and, 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 and it's everywhere. But the imagination, the religious imagination of the people around their God was one, that he was male, two, that he controlled the world from outside, from up above, and don't cross him, because if you cross him, you will be punished. And the story of the covenant is the story of a people who were not faithful, and a God who, for example, used Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, to destroy the temple and take the people into exile. You know, what are you asking me to imagine about this God? Or as we'll see tomorrow, this is a God who will give blindness. This is a God who will give leprosy. This is a God who will give you all sorts of afflictions if you don't tow the party line. And of course, once you get this notion of God, it became a powerful weapon in community to control the community. On the one hand, if we take the Jewish people, yes, isn't it a great thought that, you know, we are God's people? So God breaks out from heaven and speaks to one group on earth. It's almost, you know, if I play God for a moment, and I love doing this, uh, <laughs> it's like I look around the earth and I look for the most God-forsaken, downtrodden group I can find on this planet, and I look at it and say, yes, you're it. <laughs> okay? So you're going to be my people. How does it feel? <laughs> What's it saying to all these people? Immediately we had this divisive, elitist, religious notion that, that an elsewhere God in the heavens relates with one group. Oh yeah, all people are God's people. Yeah, 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 but we're really it. 
And then what happens is you get this control mechanism grows up within the community and it's going to be these two who are responsible for this, not the women. I'm pointing to the men, <laughs> okay? It's going to be the, the, the male controllers of the community who will use the notion of God to control the community. And so cultural community laws will be elevated to divine law. Pick up the book of Leviticus and page after page after page you're going to read God appeared to Moses and God said to Moses, you cannot touch a woman at the time of menstruation. What? What, 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 what? what are you asking me to imagine that there's this God out there who really thinks about this? <laughs> In the Roman Catholic Church today, officially, God really thinks about whether women should be ordained priests. Hey? What's the, what's the image of God? that drives theology, that drives religion. It's a controlling mechanism, for heaven's sake. Eh? Not for God's sake. I shouldn't say for heaven's sake either. <laughs> no. It's for the sake of institutional leadership. That's what it's become. We can tell you what God thinks. Should we be surprised in Christianity that institutional leadership in Christianity wants to hang on to this notion of God? Because it can keep playing out this mindset, ah, yes, there is a God out there, and you know what? Uniquely, we have access to that God and you don't. And if you want access to that God, you have to come into our group. Christian theology. And as we'll see later tonight and then tomorrow morning, what's the story of Jesus that we're going to tell? If that's the concept of God, where does Jesus come from? Well, we Christians have told the story for 2,000 years in this imagination. It's about a God who disconnected, a God who folded the arms, as it were, a God who refused access to himself, a God who set up a plan by choosing this group. Apparently that's what Christians think. It's not even remotely real, but that's what Christianity has taught for 2,000 years. A God in heaven chose this group to prepare the world for the coming of his son from where? Well, have a look. <laughs> it's going to be a drop down from heaven. What, what are you asking me to imagine? What, what are you asking me to believe? In the 21st century? And then of course our theology of revelation is hooked into that. That God, scripture, our Christian scriptures, God only speaks to God's people, then later to the Christian group. In the year 2000, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued a document, Dominus Jesus, that says only our Christian and Jewish scriptures are inspired by God. Vatican II never dealt with a different understanding of revelation. Verbum Dei is locked into that imagination. God, God's word, God from heaven speaks to one group. It's God's word. In my new book, I, I quote the, the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that God chose certain men to write exactly what God wanted written and no more. I think, what, you wrote that in 1996? What? Our theology of revelation. And even when we changed the world and put Australia on top of the world, <laughs> I mean, you're a fool, you think you're on top of the world, huh? <laughs> and then our up-down language becomes even more ridiculous if you literalize it. There's no up and down anymore. If you go up, I don't know where you're going, but we're going up to where God is, so it doesn't make any sense anymore. <laughs> Our 
When I was a boy, we never had that image. When I was ordained a priest in 1969, we did not have that image of the, of the earth. Here we are in comparison to some of our companions. I was in a church in Florida about three or four years ago and, and the priest brought the children up for the children's liturgy and he showed this slide and a little voice called out, Pluto's not a planet! <laughs> <laughs> and the priest said, who said that? And this little boy put his hand up and he said, how old are you? Four! You know, different imagination. Huh? Here we are in comparison with some of our cousins. And then we come to this incredible star that we call our sun. And we're so small we hardly, hardly rate. Now, we're into a different imagination, a different understanding of reality. Earth is not the centre of the universe. We'll see, see more of that in a moment. But here's the incredible thing to try and wrap our minds around. This incredible star that we depend so totally on on this planet. As we know human travel today, we humans will never travel outside the light and the pull of that star. Never. Never, as we know travel today. This is it. Then you look at this star and it's not a particularly big star. <laughs> and then you start talking in distances, in sizes that our minds simply cannot grasp. 427 light years, 600 light years, okay, multiply 5.8 trillion miles by 600. And, and we're just in one part of the Milky Way galaxy. And, and what's happening is that our minds are being expanded, our, 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 our sense of reality. Now, this has happened in our lifetime, in our lifetime. We're, we're the first generations of humans to have this sense of mind-blowing, wow! And I haven't even started yet. Here's Andromeda, the nearest galaxy to us, I call it the Twin Galaxy, has hundreds of billions of stars. Hundreds of billions of stars like ours. One galaxy. The Hubble telescope, they pointed the telescope to a dark area of the sky. They weren't sure what was there, so over several nights they pointed the telescope there. They say it's the equivalent if you held a five cent piece at arm's length and you took a photo of that area of sky. 10,000 galaxies. <coughs> Imagine just going outside and 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. How many galaxies are out there? Hundreds and hundreds of billions and billions of galaxies. Just last week, I travelled through Chicago and my wife and I, we went to the planetarium in Chicago and watched a couple of films. And at, at the end of the films, both of them had this uh, amazing five-minute segment where it sort of takes you through the galaxies and, and you know, galaxies are whizzing past you. The theatres were full of school children, school children. This is their imagination. One of my thoughts when I came out, when I said to Mary, you know, for every single human who's ever lived on this planet, we've probably each got a billion galaxies, <laughs> you know? And, and, and we think we're the centre of the universe. So ground on which I choose to stand. I'm not saying this is, this is where people need to be, but if I articulate where I stand, there is not a God in the sense 
of, of a localized deity out there. You know, the way, the way scripture imagined it. Let me say it this way. Growing up Catholic Christian, my primary window to the divine, apart from family and friends, was scripture, obviously, and, and church teaching. And the stories from scripture and church teaching, the, these were the primary windows. These told me what God was like and where God was and how it all worked. And now, today I say, you know, that's not my primary window anymore. My primary window is what we're about to see. There's not a localized God out there. This word God is going to point to something beyond the notion of God that I grew up with, the notion of God in Scripture, in Paul, in John's Gospel, in Nicaea, and in Christian Christology. So what I've tried to do, coming to this awareness, excuse me, there's no sense just saying, I don't believe that anymore. No, what I want to do and what I've tried to do is say, can I go into my Christian tradition and find a notion of the divine that, that makes sense when I look at those images from the Hubble telescope? So I start to set off and I find, yes, in my Christian tradition, whether it's Thomas Aquinas or Augustine and others, that this word God is, has to point to a mystery that's beyond the idea of a deity shaped in our human imagination. It has to be beyond uh, the sense of you know, a, a localized deity who thinks, who plots, who plans, who intervenes from outside. This G-O-D is, is it, it's much bigger than that. that that's a human construct put on a mystery, and then we literalize that construct and say, that's what God is. And God just happens to think the way we think on all sorts of issues. A God who listens, a God who speaks, and I would maintain that probably 95% or 99% of Christians in their prayer still pray to a God who listens to them. If I were to pray tonight, Oh God, we thank you for the beautiful day. Oh God, send your spirit. Oh God, the question is, what, do, what are you asking me to imagine? What's at the other end of that prayer? And somebody says, oh well, you know, I, I know God's not a male. I know God's not a listening deity. And I say, well, why are you using language that constantly suggests there's someone listening to you? I'll come back to that tomorrow. I, I will do a session on prayer tomorrow. It's a big issue. All my life, all my life, I have been steeped in vocal liturgical prayers that has prayed to God. Think about it. In liturgy, in our vocal prayers, we're praying to God. What are you asking me to imagine? Yes, Michael, I thank you for phoning in today. I need to hear from you. I'll <laughs> Well, how many people carry a sense from this upbringing? You know, I, I pray to God and God will think about it and get back. And if I really pray, then God will do something. Isn't that deep in our imagination, in our practice? I think so. What are you asking me to imagine? Big question. Does God think? Do you think God thinks? I'll talk about this later tonight, maybe. If I don't do it tonight, I'll do it tomorrow morning. I don't think God thinks. Thinking's a human phenomenon. You know, we get information, we store it, we you know, think about it and we make decisions. Thinking. The universe does not operate that way. Our, our, his, our tradition has always told us that God points to a mystery beyond our human notions 
and our human images. So that whatever we can see this mystery to be, then we've got to go beyond that and say, it's bigger than that. Of course, we want to keep personalizing God, and that's fine to imagine, to personify, but what we keep doing is then we literalize our personification, and we have a God who thinks, has all sorts of opinions, intervenes, punishes. We've got to get beyond that. So the ground, again, in which to stand, again, it's in our tradition. What's helped me is to go to my Christian tradition and find what I learnt in the seminary. That this word God points to a mystery that is the ground of all being. This word God points to the creator, the source, the sustainer of all that is. I go to my tradition, I, I rediscover what I was told as a small boy. God is everywhere. Oh, well, okay, let me try and take that seriously now. Let me try and move away from an imagination of a localised deity up there and, and go to this other story that's in my Christian tradition and that I've been taught, but sort of gave lip service to, that this mystery is an everywhere reality. Oh, okay, let, well, what can I do with this then? When I look at an image like this, God is everywhere. What are you asking me to imagine? So again, let me use this pink overlay. If I were teaching children, and if I were to say to them, would somebody come out to the front of the class and, and show me where you think God is? You know, I, I would hope that, you know, no one would come out and think, I, I think God is up here, you know, God is above us. Or God is more here than there. No, God is everywhere. Well, let's put God everywhere. Let this pink overlay represent the divine, creative, energizing presence that holds, sustains everything in existence. And let me, as a Christian, honor thoroughly a belief that everything has its being and existence in this mystery and that there is no outside of it. Do I fully understand that? No, no, no. But today, I feel called as a Christian Catholic to honour it. What does it mean to say the divine, creative presence is everywhere sustaining, holding everything in existence? The breath of God is everywhere. A presence holding everything in relationship and connectedness from the subatomic world to the galactic world. This presence is everywhere. So if I want to do theology in the 21st century, if I want to talk about Jesus, if I want to talk about prayer, if I want to talk about sacraments, if I want to talk about priesthood, if I want to talk about church or Christian life, I take an adult decision. This is my adult decision. I will do those things today in the firm and utter conviction that I live in a universe that is totally and utterly permeated with the Divine Presence. I will turn my back, I will turn my head away from any theology or any theological thought or religious practice that is locked into a notion of disconnection from the Divine. It's an adult decision I make. And we're free to make that decision or not. I'll come back to this image later tonight. And as we look at the other images that I'll, I'll put up now, let's try it. I'm not going to use the pink sheet every time. <laughs> But I want to take seriously, I mean the scientific language is, you know, we live in a universe with a psychic spiritual dimension, I'll talk about this later. You know, everything is connected, everything is in relationship. Mind, consciousness is everywhere in the universe. Well, he's appointed to this mystery. I'm not saying it's God, but it's a, a pointer to help me to appreciate the divine is everywhere. 
But this mystery I call God comes to expression throughout this universe, in and through what it has to work with. I'll look at this later. That's why this planet of ours is so extraordinary that the divine presence here can come to expression in a way it cannot do on Mars or Venus. Yet it's there. So where is God when we, in the 21st century, look at images from the Hubble telescope? Because these are the images that will shape faith of the future. There's no, there's no doubt about that. These are the images. Not the scriptural notion of, of, a, of a God who lived in heaven. There's no way that will shape future faith. There's no way. No. People are going to become immersed in here and then we'll go back, as we will do tomorrow, and look at scripture and we'll do it with great reverence and respect for the way the divine broke through into our planet. Or the way, not broke through, but the way it surfaced in our planet. So it's not just where is God, what is God? What do I think I'm dealing with with this word G-O-D? This is one of my favourite images, a gigantic cloud of dust and gas that's trillions and trillions and trillions of miles across and it, it's so hot it's forming stars and the young stars are just leaving the nursery as it were. Is God watching this? Is God outside of it? Or is it all giving expression to this divine, creative, energizing presence at work in our universe? The Cat's Eye Nebula. So again, I find it important to go into my Christian tradition and see, can I find in my Christian tradition something, something that makes sense today for me? Here's Gregory of Nyssa, and, and what I do find, of course, it, 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 it's in the mystical tradition, because the mystics speak the language of connection, intimacy, and so on. Theology has always spoken the language of disconnection. So here's Gregory of Nyssa, a good warning to us. And this one I really, really appreciate. When one considers the universe, can you be so single-minded as to believe, as not to believe, that the divine is present in everything, pervading, embracing and penetrating it? God is everywhere. What am I dealing with? What I find particularly interesting with this is, look at the date. <laughs> what else happened in the 4th century? We did the Council of Nicaea in 325. And what was the Council of Nicaea trying to decide? Who is Jesus, that Jesus could win access to a God who lived up there. Two different voices, two different streams of thought in Christian tradition. How come one stream of thought prevailed and became the dominating stream of thought? My answer to that is, it gave institutional identity, uniqueness and power and authority. We can get you to heaven, and only if you come through us. Not only can we get you there, but we can tell you what that God thinks about all sorts of things. What a powerful weapon of control. And if you don't obey us, you know where you're going, don't you? Oh my goodness, it sounds familiar. Here's Augustine. God above whom there is nothing, without whom there's nothing, outside of whom there's nothing, without whom nothing exists. And I, I, I find that extraordinary. You know, here's on the one hand Augustine saying this, then you turn the pages, and, and Augustine is saying, every child born into this planet is born into a state of utter separation from God. I was like, come on, hey? You, you can't have it both ways. 
There's a disconnect here. It's time to stop the disconnect. So who can tell me who said this? If you can tell me who said it, I'll give you a free book. <laughs> it's not Einstein. John 23rd. No. I've never given away a free book. <laughs> a 12th century Islamic reformist. Yeah, okay. Which is interesting because it, it calls us to, to respect. We're not the first people to deal with this. <laughs> eh? There's a long tradition in Islam, in Judaism, and in Christianity dealing with precisely what we're trying to deal with today. God is bigger than what the institution has made God. So here we're ending up with God everywhere. What imagination will I walk on? A story that tells me that planet Earth was disconnected from God? Or a story that tells me, as we'll see after our break, that the divine is everywhere, it's always been here? Is it that? Or is it that? You might like to have a buzz for five minutes or so, just around the table, first of all. You know, what are you hearing? What's it saying? What do you think maybe some of the implications are for you? Um, after about just, just five, five minutes, just a, a, a quick, then we'll have a stand-up break for a while, okay? This will be a, a shorter session, the good news. I generally have a policy of not taking questions and comments um, because usually I have to say, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow, okay? <coughs> And what I'm keen to do is at least tonight to provide a perspective in which tomorrow we can look at Jesus and the questions that will come up. And certainly tomorrow afternoon we'll devote uh, the last hour or so to whatever questions, comments we, we may have together. Okay. This is one of my favourite images and it helps me uh, for myself to tell the story of the human because that's another key, okay? We've looked at this imagination around this mystery we call God, and, and now the other key issue in faith is, what is the story of the human that I tell? And it's going to, for me, certainly be very different from the story that I grew up with and the story that I've heard in liturgy most of my life, that, you know, we're exiles from God and, and heaven is, you know, what it's all about. And, you know, that's where we'll really meet God. This is uh, an image taken from the Hubble telescope and it's the remnant of a supernova, a giant star that has exploded. And, and this, it, it's a cloud of dust and gas that is literally trillions and trillions of miles across. And what will happen eventually is that gravity will come into force and, and condense all that. And the story that the astronomers tell us today is that four and a half billion years ago in the Milky Way galaxy, a supernova exploded like that. And when gravity eventually got it and condensed it, then 98% of it went up to make that star out there that we call our sun, and the leftover bits were the planets. So four and a half billion years ago, our solar system came into being because a supernova exploded and gave new life. I mean, talk about death and resurrection, okay. But here's the interesting story. Hydrogen atoms in our bodies, they're, they're the oldest atoms. They go back 13.7 billion years ago to soon after the Big Bang. And then hydrogen atoms melded together and formed helium and then helium and hydrogen. And then you get lithium and you go up through what we know as the periodic table of elements, formation of elements, until you get to iron. Now when you get to iron, there's not enough heat in the stars 
to manufacture the elements higher in the periodic table than iron. You need greater heat than that. And that heat is provided by a supernova exploding. And so in the supernova exploding are uh, manufactured the uh, atoms like carbon, gold, silver, and, 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 and so on. So here's the story. The scientific story tells us that every hydrogen atom in our bodies, which are most of the atoms, the majority, have been moving around the universe, or certainly this neck of the, <laughs> uh, of the galaxy, uh, for over 13 billion years. And then every carbon atom, and then every other atom in our bodies, was once out there in a gigantic cloud of dust and gas. So every part of us, every part of us was once out there in a dust cloud of gas and so on like that four and a half billion years ago. So this is the scientific story that what they call stardust. Stardust has been in a process of transformation for four and a half billion years. And then some of that stardust eventually came to form planet Earth. And then other bits of stardust kept coming down, of course, and water came. And so the universe found a way, and I'll talk about this later tonight maybe, the universe found a way in processes of transformation and working together, cooperating, atoms and molecules cooperating, that the universe found a way after four and a half billion years, that stardust, once out there in this cloud of dust, ends up like this. I mean, what? <laughs> now, that is, what? <laughs> okay, <laughs> the first what was not right. <laughs> hey? This is the story that future generations are going to learn from science. That, that we are the universe finding a way to produce a life form that comes to conscious awareness of itself. We're, we're like the universe finding a way to reflect on itself. And nowhere else in the universe do we know that that happened. We don't know, that may well be in other galaxies, who knows? But at the moment it's like, hey, this is it. And what do we do with this? You know, where, where's our sense of wonder? Where, where, is our, where is our sense of awe? Paul Davies, the eminent physicist, says that there are carbon atoms in our bodies that were once in the Buddha. The scientific story today is that every living organism that died more than a thousand years ago there are carbon atoms from that organism in our bodies today. And so Paul Davies goes on to say, there are carbon atoms in our bodies that were once in Jesus of Nazareth. Talk about connection. <laughs> the argon gas that we breathe in. <gasps> I saw on PBS a, 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 a film of this. And, and the presenter said, the same, the same molecules of argon gas you're breathing in, Jesus of Nazareth breathed in. He what? I mean, talk about connection. So then over this story, I mean, this, this is a story to be a, a story of, of, of utter wonder. And my lament is, my lament is, why isn't this story out there enough? Thomas Berry says, this is the story that we have to take into our education system, we have to take into our medical system, we have to take into our legal profession, we have to take into our universities. This sense of relatedness, that, that you know, the universe, that the human gives the universe a way to reflect on itself. I mean, what a story of wonder. Then to this story then, <coughs> We put our faith story and we say, and it all happens in the divine. God is not out somewhere, out, out somewhere watching it. No, no, the divine creative energizing presence is that reality that underpins it. 
I like Jared Manley Hopkins' phrase of a universe charged with the grandeur of God. And, and it's like this mystery I call God is, is the underpinning, uh, energizing reality that, that charges everything that is. And here's a story of four and a half billion years ago in this presence. And then you get to this incredible planet, four and a half billion years old, and you ask the question today, where is the divine creative presence we call God? And then we look at the other images, and I say, you know, from the first moment of its existence, this planet had its being in the divine presence that the divine, creative, energizing presence has always been here. It, it could not, we could not, the planet could not exist without that presence. That presence is the reality underpinning all reality. And so whatever is happening in this planet for four and a half billion years has been underpinned, charged by the divine, creative, energizing presence we call God. And here, this is the incredible story, here on this planet, just the right distance from a star, just the right gravitational field, bombarded by meteors and comets and all sorts of things, and, and, and 80% of its water comes from out, outer space. And so you have water, you have the conditions, and here on this planet, the divine, creative, energizing presence can come into expression in the way it cannot do on Mars or Venus or Jupiter or for all we know anywhere else in the universe. And when the conditions are right, this reality that we put this word God on, this reality comes to expression working in and through what is there. And here on this incredible planet, almost in a cosmic nowhere, in this incredible planet, the divine presence finds a way to come to expression in life and life takes off. And then the scientific story tells us that at least four times in the history of life on this planet, at least four times, most of life has been annihilated, mainly through asteroids hitting the planet or great ice ages. You know, children can go to the library and learn that dinosaurs died out 63 million years ago. It's a bit hard then for a religious teacher to come in and, and say, you know, humankind's emerged into paradise. Well, come on. No, no, they didn't. The scientific story tells us that before the human life species emerged on this planet, before we emerged, 99.9% .9 of every living species that had ever lived on this planet was annihilated. 99.9% .9 of every living species that has ever lived on this planet was annihilated before human life emerged. We're doing our best to wipe out the 0.1%. <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's death, there's annihilation, there's resurrection, and, and there's, there's the power that drives the universe. The power that drives the universe at work on this planet. It's like, yes, there is death, there's destruction, there's upheaval, but this power, when the conditions are right, it's like you can't keep it down. It keeps, keeps, and it resurrects into new life into new forms, new ways of expressing itself. And then the human story, the human story then tells us that here on this planet, over this long, convoluted, up and down, very fragile evolutionary process, that eventually a life form evolved and this life form became consciously aware. And this life form, as we said earlier, had a sense of, of, of somehow a spirit world all around it. What is this life form? What is this life form that we call humanity? 
So on the one hand, I tell the story, I, I tell this amazing, wonderful story from science. We are stardust come together in, in, in this human configuration. And, and I have what, 70, 80, 90, going up, going up, 95, okay, years you know, to be this human expression of the universe reflecting on itself. Wow! Then I bring my faith perspective and I say, you know, it's not just a scientific story. The divine, creative, energizing presence called God finds a way in the universe on this incredible pin dot of a planet to find a way to come to expression in the human and the divine finds a way to be consciously aware in us. You say, what? What, what, what are you telling me? I'm not a poor banished child of Eve. I, I have 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years to give human expression to the divine energizing presence that holds all the universe, that charges all the universe. I have so many years to give human expression to this power at work in the universe in human form. And what am I doing with it? What am I doing with it? And we keep telling a story. We keep telling a story about, you know, depraved humanity. We keep telling a story about being in exile from God, being disconnected. We keep telling a story, the next life is the real life with God. Where's our sense of wonder? Where's our sense of awe? Where's our sense of response to this? See, to me, I think one of the biggest issues for, for the human race, for the human species today, is to find a story that unites us, that brings us together, you know, whether we're Christian or Jews or Buddhist or humanist or, or whatever. But the first thing we have to tell is this wonderful human story. Look at the wonder of what it is of being human. And only when you get that in place, only when you get that in place, do you tell your religious story. Because if we get the human story wrong, you know, poor banished children of the Lord, I'm not worthy, poor me, you know, humanity's just a trial to see whether I get up there. Well, if that's our human story, our religious story is cockeyed. We have at our disposal, Thomas Berry certainly said this again and again, it's the first time in human history we, we have a common story. You know, and I mean, what a story this is. So, you know, in, in terms of, you know, am I, am I at all disturbed by, you know, leaving aside, you know, images of faith you know, about humanity, about God, about Jesus, you know, from an old story. Am I, am I disturbed by that? No way! No way! Because I think he, he is, he's a far more wonderful story. And what we're going to do tomorrow, we're going to put Jesus in this story. Because I think Jesus saw this. I think Jesus, I, I think the divine creative presence came to expression in human form. And people had a sense of it, but then they put it up there, of course. But I think Jesus, Jesus saw it. And, and, and Jesus had a dream. What, what, if, what if everyone could see what I see? What if everyone can see that? Then we would create the kingdom of God on earth that would not be a society dominated by, you know, uh, military power and domination and control and putting people down. No, it would, be, it would be humankind moving with the divine creative presence in and amongst them. 
But as we'll see tomorrow, the first thing Jesus had to do was to get the crowd to see what he saw. And if the crowd didn't see what he saw, this would never happen. This is what I think is so wonderful about this contemporary story. Because I say, if it's true today, it was true 2,000 years ago. So he asked the question, where did Jesus come from? Is that where he came from? Because that's our tradition. God so loved the world that God sent his son. Where, where is God in that? Where did Jesus go when he died? Is the resurrection the great big bang of religious experience that, that no one before Jesus had access to God in heaven? Is the resurrection all about, for the first time in human history, when someone died, he was able to go up where God lived? Have you heard that story? Of course we've heard it. And then you get on dangerous ground because it's like, don't you dare question that story because you can't be a Christian anymore. And of course only Jesus can get us up there. But what if I'm not in that imagination anymore? What if I don't believe in disconnection? What if that's not my story? What if this is my story? And where did Jesus come from? Jesus came as we all come, from the divine, creative, energizing presence we call God. Jesus gave the most wonderful human expression to the divine in human form. But where, where did he come from? He came from the earth as we did. He gave expression to the universe as we did. He gave human expression to the mystery of God as we do. The key question about tomorrow for Jesus is, is the primary story that Christians tell about Jesus in the future, will it be a story that says to people, for God's sake and your own sake, open your eyes and see this, and see that the divine creative presence is in all people, all people, not just Jews, not just Christians, but anyone who lives in love gives expression to the divine and God, the divine, lives in them. And if everyone could see that, we'd change the face of the world. Or are we going to keep telling a story, oh no, 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 yeah, we give lip service to that. No, the real importance of Jesus of Nazareth is that he died on a cross to get us into heaven where God really lives. It's dangerous ground, isn't it? Of course it's dangerous ground. It's the biggest shift ever, ever in Christianity. The biggest shift ever. And institutional religion will not help us with this shift. There's too much investment in that. Too much investment in it. So we'll walk through this gently tomorrow <laughs> as we look at Jesus. So what do we think Jesus was trying to do? That's what I think Jesus was trying to do. He was trying to convert people to see what he saw, to experience what he experienced. But Christianity, as we'll see tomorrow afternoon, changed that totally. And we ended up with a Jesus who is nothing like us, really. Oh, we say he's human. But now we put all the divinity in him, and we ended up poor, banished children of Eve, mourning and weeping in a valley of tears, struggling to get to God, and dependent on middle management. <laughs> which is not what Jesus wanted us to do. So time for another break. Sit with that for a little while. Just, okay, have, have another talk for five or 10 minutes. Here we are.
But isn't it, isn't it in negative of the notion or the image of God that many people have? When people ask the question, why did God let my wife die? Why did God let this happen? Why did God? That's the sort of God we've got, the, you know, external manipulator. Very briefly, I, I want to go into a total different direction for about 15 minutes or so, and that will wind it up, and we have some questions, comments, and then uh, sale, I'll sign some books. 60 trillion cells in the human body. Give or take a trillion or so, it doesn't matter. 60 trillion. And every cell is made up of 1,000 million, 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 million atoms. So do your maths quickly. <laughs> right. How many atoms in the human body? Well, if you can say that, you're a genius. Okay, so hydrogen and oxygen, because we're mostly composed of water anyway, and carbon. Okay. Bruce Lipton in his book, Biology of Belief, ha has a, a wonderful uh, story or image, and, and it resonates with what I saw at a IMAX theatre once, what was about atoms, and the presenter was talking about a carbon atom. He said, if you blew a carbon atom up to the size of the theatre, let's say this room, okay, and then you look for the hard, what seemed to be the, the hard sort of what we would have called the nucleus, the, the hard part of the atom. So we've blown the atom up to the size of this room. Now where's the hard part of the atom? He said you'd be searching on the floor for a little, little, little speck. And most of the atom is 99.999% empty space. Bruce Lipton has this image, he said, imagine if you could shrink yourself and take yourself down and you get inside the atom and you could take a photo of this little speck. And you take your photo and you come out and you develop. And he said, what would you see? And he said, you'd see nothing. He said, because what seems to be the hard part is actually like a vortice of energy. That everything in the universe is composed of vortices of energy. And why does it seem hard then, if this is 99.999% empty space? Because, oh, we'll go back here, because of electromagnetic energy between things. Okay, so let's go back to the cells. Every cell makes 2,000 proteins every second. So we've got 60 trillion cells doing this. And each protein's made up of several hundred amino acids. So this is what's happening. I have 60 trillion cells selecting between 100,000 to 500,000 amino acids every second, organizes them, joins them, checks them, sends them to work. What? I mean, no wonder we wake up tired, eh? Yeah. But here's the point that I want to make. This body is a community of 60 trillion individuals who work together to create this community. And not one of them is thinking about it. Wouldn't we be in a mess eh? if the cells had to think, now, now what did I do? Which protein did I get? Uh, uh, did I? I think about when I was I can't think about this, but I'm, you know, logically, I can't remember. When I was an embryo in my mother's womb, and, 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 and the cells started to multiply, how is it that some cells knew to go and form my eyes, and other cells to form my ears, and other cells my liver, or my kneecaps? And they're not thinking about it. They're not thinking about it. And then I think about that and I think th this, this is indicative of how the universe operates. Hydrogen doesn't think about how to gather with itself to form helium. Atoms don't think about it. I think of the extraordinary development, maybe on the next slide. Okay, before I get there, let me go, just go back. 
The speed with which these activities take place is, is mind-boggling. And sometimes the speed is so quick uh, and, and, and it, it, it doesn't, it's not as if it goes from nerve cell to nerve cell to nerve cell. It's non-relational, the scientists say. It's like, it, it jumps across. And you're like, I mean, how, how does this happen? And it's happening in my body. So, there's a point of here for me of, of this communication beyond contact. It's immediate, it's beyond anything the human mind can comprehend. Now when I think about that, I think about, look what we've done with our imagination around this mystery we call God. We take our human mode of thinking, which is very, very slow. We have to get information, we have to process it, make judgment, and then act. And what do we do? We have traditionally, in our scriptures, in our theology, we have put that mode of operation on God. So God thinks. As I said earlier, God has opinions about all sorts of things. Just some people know what God thinks and God will tell us what it is. <laughs> eh? God plans, God intervenes. Eh? You, play, you, 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 you pray properly and then God will respond accordingly. We, we, have, we have this traditional image of, of, of a deity who, who acts according to our human mode of acting or thinks according to our human mode of thinking, even though we say God is bigger than all that. And I think the trap for many Christians is with our prayer, that we keep being trapped into that notion of a God who thinks about it will get back to us. And here, here we have a sense that, that embedded in the universe is a way of communication that is instant, it's immediate, it's non-relational, it doesn't stop and think the way we do. So maybe I've got to think a bit differently about the way I'm in relationship with God in prayer. We'll come back to that tomorrow. This is really why we wake up tired. <laughs> and again, I mean, I can't even say that figure. But if this is the way, if this is the way of action within ourselves that is so, oh, then let's stop putting our slow, Neanderthal, human mode of operating on God. Let's stop doing that. And let's begin to live with a mystery that is beyond us. I think the wonderful thing on this planet or well, the wonderful mystery is, you know, for a long time, for millions of years, there are only single cell in your life on the planet. And then you got to a stage where when oxygen became rampant and some cells couldn't deal with oxygen and they learned to get together with other cells that could. Now, here, here's, here's the wonder. A single cell got together with another single cell to create a life form beyond themselves. And then they could store that in memory, you know, with perception, remember, and then eventually that multicellular life form could move on and repeat. How did single cells, how, how I was going to say, what on earth? What, what is it? What is it that enabled, that moved, that motivated, that charged, if you like, a single cell to get together with another single cell unlike itself and then create something beyond both of them. And we just say, oh, that's the way it works. <laughs> no, it, it's not the way it works and it's not the way the scientific world would say today it's the way it works. No, the scientific world would say to us today, no, you know, there's a sense of mind, communication operating here that is beyond our, our, our human mode of operating. And it's instant, but it's communication, and it's working together to create something beyond themselves. And the, the wonder of this is, it's embedded. It's embedded in the universe. <clears throat> and that in this embeddedment 
uh, embedment of, of, of everything sort of connected, what the scientists today will call consciousness. They're not talking about conscious awareness, but they'll use the word consciousness or mind. That somehow there's, there's an operating principle all through the universe of bringing things together, getting to cooperate and produce something beyond themselves. Because if that were not there, then there'd be no expansion, there'd be no growth, there'd be no coming together. So here's a pointer to the Divine Presence for me today. I, 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 I don't know what God is, but I want to respect the idea that the window for me today to this mystery I call God is I, I think about energy all through the universe. And I think, you know, energy doesn't think. Energy does not think about what it's doing. And then I, I, I read this scientific language about, and all through this energy, all through the universe, is the reality of consciousness, of mind. And it's instantaneous. And to me it's like, wow! You know, I've got to think about God this way? Wow! This is a bigger mystery than I ever thought God was, you know. You know God was quite controllable before, you know. God put his arms around Michael and said, Michael, I love you, you know. Yeah, well, that's fine, that's fine, that's a great image. But don't literalize the image and say that's what God is. Now, wow, what am I dealing with? So energy, consciousness, everywhere. This for me is the window to the divine today. And I'll use this window to look at Jesus tomorrow. I'll, I'll use it to look at the formation of the Jewish religion tomorrow. It doesn't come from up there. It's embedded in the universe. It's embedded on this earth. And it comes, it comes to expression in the human. I'm going to finish with this. When I read science, I see the scientists talking about patterns of operation in the universe. It's become one of my favourite terms to use now, the patterns of operation. So I go to science and ask, you know, what are the patterns at work at the universe? Because if we can discern patterns of operation, of, you know, development and expansion and evolution, then these patterns would be suggested to me as a person of faith that this is how the divine expresses itself. I think that's fair enough, that's where I, I, I stand, okay. So I go to the scientific world and the scientific world tells me the story that, that particles get together and form atoms. And then atoms get together and form complex atoms. And complex atoms get together and form molecules. And complex molecules go through to DNA and then DNA to living organisms. And out of this ever-increasing complexity emerges human consciousness. And what is this? It's a pattern of gathering together and cooperation. And here's the rub. That when you get to that bottom line, you get to the only life form that we know in existence that can say, we will not cooperate. <laughs> we are the only life form in existence that can say, we will not work together. We are the only life form in existence that can consciously, consciously say, we will not fit with the divine patterns at work in the universe. We will be violent, we will be selfish, we will be divisive, we will be greedy, we will dominate, we'll go for power. We're charged. The human is charged with this divine, creative, energizing presence we call God. This is our story. Not that, but this. 
And if this is the story today, then I would expect to find in the human community from the very first days of its beginnings, I would expect to find embedded in the human, in all places at all time, if this is the story, I would expect to find embedded in the human this divine, creative, energizing presence coming to expression, given voice in the human, and what would I expect this voice to say? I would expect this voice to say, stop the violence, work together, cooperate, love one another. And the important thing of this is, I expect to find it embedded in the human. It's not about a God out there telling us how to act. We don't need a God out there telling us how to act. The divine creative presence is here. And for all of human history, it's been here. And what a tragedy it is when religion took it and put it up there. But all the while, all the while, it was here in the people. And all the while, religion has told this other story about the divine. It's time to tell this story again. To tell the story of the wonder of humanity. And that we're all in this story. Whoever lives in love gives human expression to the divine. It has nothing to do with being a Jew or a Buddhist or a Christian. You know, in a sense of being, you know, we have it, you don't. No. But we have a Buddhist way of living this, we have a Christian way of living it, a Jewish way, an Islamic way, a humanist way of living it. But gee whiz, it's time for the human community to discover a story that brings us together. And what we'll see tomorrow is that Jesus, Jesus, preaches that story. And he was ready to die for it. He was ready to die for this story not because of God locked us out of heaven, but because if humankind doesn't grab this story, it will stay in a story where we allow, where we allow the greedy, the powerful to dominate, to oppress, to shape our society, to shape our religion, to shape the way we are in relationship with one another, other countries. And Jesus says, it's not like that. No, you are to be neighbor. You are to be gracious to one another as the divine is to you. That's the story we'll tell tomorrow. So just to end up, if anyone wants to make a comment or a clarification before we end, um, we, we're going to half nine, but no, we can end now, then we can stay on and talk and I'll sign books for a while. So, but. As I said, you know, don't ask me questions about, you know, uh, is Jesus the second person of the Trinity or, you know, or, you know I mean, I mean, because we will come to a lot of, you know, issues tomorrow, but yes, yes. Could you call that kind of gathering together and communicating love? Love. Yeah, you call it love. You certainly call it relationship. Yeah, it's about relationship and, and the human way of doing that is to love. So. You know, it, it resonates with everything we've learnt. That, that to give love, that to love, is the best possible human expression of the divine. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is there a place for organized... Is there a place for organized religion? Come back tomorrow about 3.30. <laughs> yeah. let, let me say this. Yes, there is. There is. And... But organized religion has to tell the right story. The classic example for me is Pope John Paul II. Here's this great media man who went, went around the world and, uh, you know, sort of played up to the cameras, and yet he gave us Dominus Jesus. You know, Dominus Jesus, that only we Catholics get to heaven and only our scriptures are combined. What if this man told that story to the world? Huh? What if the Catholic Church, as an institution, you know, one of the most powerful institutions in the, in the world, took this story to the world and told the story that everyone, this is our common story. I mean, 
it would surely change things. It must. And this is the great issue going on today. I mean, no, you know, the, the issue over doctrine. No, 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 no. We've got to protect our doctrine that tells us we're unique. That only through life in Jesus do people get to heaven. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got to tell the difference. That's what I keep saying. You've got to tell the human story and tell your faith story. Stop telling our faith story in an old story that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Yes? What can you say about the ability of ours of saying no, of not cooperating? How does that fit with the divine? Uh, let me talk about it tomorrow, okay? Yeah, <laughs> true, be, because the question usually comes about, well, where does evil fit into this? Yes, yes okay, and i talk to it tomorrow. Did you have it? No, just waving. No, yeah. no, sorry. Sorry, yes. Would you mind clarifying for me? Would I clarify for you? What you mean by mind. What I mean by mind. It, I, I, I'm interested that, that, that scientists talk this language. Uh, I, I first came across it with, in Bede Griffith, actually. And, and Bede Griffith is talking about it as, as an operating principle that's everywhere in the universe. An operating, organizing principle that's everywhere in the universe. That without this, nothing works. Nothing comes together. So what is it that comes together? Our, our confusion, my confusion, our confusion, I think, uh, comes from, we think of mind as human mind. And then we read consciousness and mind and and, and scientists are very careful to say, no, we're not talking about our human conscious mind. We're not talking about human consciousness. We're, we're talking about that everything is somehow interrelated and embedded in this. Uh, in reality, is the capacity to work together to produce something beyond itself. Yeah. Call that mind. That makes sense because I've read. You know, so it makes sense to you because you've read. Well, I've read that you know there's mind in every cell. There's mind in every cell, yes, yes. Mind is everywhere. That's what the scientists would say. Yeah. Last one and, th and then we'll, yes. Um, you seem to see God as the energy of creation. I see to seem God as the energy of creation, yes. Then how do you define death? How do I define death? Yeah. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's not a, a matter of defining it, it's a matter of understanding it. And, and then and tomorrow, I I'll say to you tomorrow, how do you understand? What do you think is going to happen to you when you die? You know, what's your imagination? Has it changed? What, what do you think? Uh, then the importance of that is, uh, you know, what happened to people who died before Jesus? What do we think happened to Jesus when he died? Uh, are we going to keep talking about the death of Jesus in the worldview of 2,000 years ago or in the scriptural worldview? Or are we going to try and interpret today what our understanding of death is? If it's true today, it was too, true 2,000 years ago. That's, that's a big one, but we will talk about it for sure. Folks, let's end there. It's 9.10 and uh, so tomorrow we'll start with with all that in place, let's look at Jesus. Okay. Thank you.